Okay, so uh, the theory of momentum. Largely, this will be review. So momentum is defined as the product of mass and velocity. Of course, that's a vector equation, so we should really have vector arrows on top of the momentum and the velocity. Momentum changes when there's a net unbalanced force. And the initial momentum plus the force, the impulse it's called, equals the final momentum. And that could be written in a variety of forms, depending on whether the forces are constant or time dependent. Let's start with a physics 12 example, but we'll do it really efficiently in just a line or two, as opposed to breaking it up into the x and y components. We can just write it all out in one step. And so what we're um, given is that there's a ball here moving at speed v. It strikes a surface obliquely and then rebounds. The ball's in contact with the wall, so it's actually on the wall here for a time t. And we just want to know um, what is the collision force. So we'll apply the impulse momentum theorem, which says that um, momentum changes when there's an unbalanced force. The unbalanced force in this case is just the, the force F from the wall. Now, momentum is the product of mass and velocity. For the initial velocity, we'll just write this in terms of i and j. So this will be v cos theta i. And then um, the y component will be along the negative y-axis, so it's minus v sine theta j, using the standard coordinate system where um, y is up the page. Now, we'll, take, we'll find the, uh, the average force meaning that it's constant, meaning that the impulse is just the collision average force multiplied by the collision time t. Uh, for the final momentum, it's the mass times the final velocity, so we've got u at angle phi. So this is u cos phi i plus u sine phi j. So rearranging and solving for the force, we're going to have the mass m over t, and then the i component is going to be u cos phi minus v cos theta. So that's the i component. Because to solve for force, you bring this over, so you end up subtracting v cos phi. Then the j component is u sine phi plus v sine theta in the j direction. So that's an expression for the collision force. And we would have solved that in physics 12, but we would have separated out the x and y components and probably not used ij notation. All right, now a little um, vector task here. Um, and the idea here, again, is that initial momentum plus the impulse um, which is the change in momentum, or the force times time, that equals the final momentum. So here's impulse. Impulse means momentum change, so we simply have to add the initial momentum and this impulse to get the final momentum, and that's what we're asked for. So we'll just do a little scale drawing here. We'll try that. Okay, so here's the initial momentum vector. Then the impulse, so I want an angle like that. That's the impulse vector. And so this would be the final momentum vector. And now we'll just label that. So this here is P final, this vector right there. Here's another example. So here's the initial momentum vector. And uh, we're given this is the force and it acts for two seconds. So for the change of momentum or the impulse, it is for a constant force, just the product of force and time, Given that the time is two seconds, we're just going to take this force vector and we're just going to double its length. That's an equals, believe it or not. And so what that impulse will look like is same direction, just twice as long. So let's again just draw a little quick scale drawing here. Well, not to scale, but roughly to scale. So here's our initial momentum vector. Then the force vector kind of acts in that direction. But we have to double it to get the impulse, because the impulse is force times two seconds. And so the final momentum vector is going to be along this direction right there. Let's label that P final. So um, <clears throat> that's for a constant force.
if we had a time-dependent force, then of course the impulse would be would require integration. So we'd integrate that time-dependent force from an initial time to a final time t. And that would be how we would find it. So let's try a question. And so here's a force. Um, it's a horizontal force. It's acting on a mass that's originally at rest, and we just want to find its final speed. So initially it's at rest. The force acts in the i direction, so a little bit later this object is going to be moving um, in the positive y direction, and we'll use the conventional chord system where that's just to the right. Okay, so it looks like that. And so uh, you could actually just do f is ma and solve this problem, or we can solve it using the impulse momentum theorem, which is really equivalent. Okay, so there's the impulse momentum theorem. So the initial momentum is just zero. So now our force is three cosine t in an extra two and a half seconds. So we'll take the initial time to be zero, then we'll integrate up to a final time, which is 2.5 seconds. And then that will give us the mass times the final velocity, which is the final momentum. Oh, I missed the i, um, because this is you know, an i force. The i just comes out of the integral just like that. That's a little messy. Let's spread that out a bit. have to remember this is a vector equation, so everything needs to be a vector. There we go. All right, so we have to integrate 3 cosine t. Well, the integral of cosine t is, of course, just sine t. And this is a definite integral, so we have to put in our upper and lower limits. The sine of 0 is just 0, so this just ends up being 3 times the sine of 2.5. And that, of course, will have to be in radians. And then that's in the i direction. And that equals 3 kilograms times vf. So the 3s just cancel, so we find our final velocity after you cancel off the threes is in the i direction and it's this number right here which is 0.598 in the i direction. All right, so that's a very simple example with a time-dependent force. Let's try another one, maybe a little bit more interesting. So this is baseball or cricket. So the ball is coming toward the bat and it strikes the bat and it flies off the bat. So this structure here is the bat. Now, we're actually um, given the force profile. Um, so the force that we're speaking of is the force that acts on the ball when it's in contact with the bat. So this will be the force here. The other arrows on this diagram are like velocity arrows. So this is the initial velocity. And then this will be the final velocity here. Now, um, this force may look a little strange, so we should talk about it. When you expand this, you could see this is going to be a negative t squared function. And you may say, well, why is the force negative when, you know, using a conventional coordinate system, this force would be in the positive direction? Well, a negative t squared function is, of course, an inverted parabola. And if you look at this function, if you set it equal to zero, you'll see one of the answers will be t equals zero. And the next root will be when this bracket is 0, and that's at t is 0 0.15. And so if you have a negative t squared function with these roots, it's sketched here, you could see that the force is actually positive for um, the time of interest. So even though the function has a negative number in front of it, Um, of course, this bracket will be negative. Ultimately, that's why you'll get a negative times a negative, so the force is actually positive on this interval. All right, so that's just a little simple math background. Um, we didn't need to do that. We could have just proceeded straight to the impulse momentum theorem, but it's probably good just to, you know, have a good understanding of this force function before we do that. So there's the impulse momentum theorem. So um, this is the mass times the initial velocity. And then here we're going to integrate that force equation that we're given from time 0 to time 0 0.15. I'll expand the bracket just to make it two terms. So it's minus 5,000 t squared when you expand the bracket, plus 
750t, and so all of this gets integrated dt in the i direction, and this equals the mass times the final velocity. Okay, now mass times initial velocity was, of course, 0 0.1 times 10 in the plus i direction. And so that's, oh, sorry, in the minus i direction. What am I saying? Using the conventional chord system, it was going to the left, right? So that's minus i. Um, and then we have to integrate this. So this is minus 5,000. The integral of t squared is, of course, t cubed over 3. Then integrating this one, it's 750t squared over 2. Then we've got to plug in 0 and plug in 0 0.15, and that's in the i direction. And um, so this is just minus 1i. Integrating this, putting in the 0 gives nothing, putting in the 0 0.15, gives us 2.81, and that's in the i direction. And so this is the impulse. Initial momentum plus impulse equals final momentum. So dividing by 0.1, we get the final velocity. And it works out to 18.125 in the positive i direction, meters per second units. OK, so there's a time-dependent force problem. Relatively straightforward integration. Now, of course, you could just take that force, let me just note that, you could take that force and divide by the mass to get the acceleration, and then just solve this as we did before, using the integrating factor to find the final velocity. That solution it will give the same answer as the one above. It's a, a, a perfectly fine way of solving it. So often at this point we say, well, why are we even bothering with this impulse momentum theorem? Why don't we just reduce it to the previous problem? Well, the reason for that is we take the impulse momentum a step further and we apply it to the collision problem, and then we get a result that we can't solve simply using um, Newtonian dynamics, force analysis. So here's a problem for you to try, similar to what we just did, except now we're going to consider two objects a 10 kilogram and a 5 kilogram. So here's the force on the 5 kilogram. Use impulse momentum, find the final speed of the 5, then use the reaction force, which acts on the 5 kilogram, so it'll be the opposite of this one. Use that to find the final speed of the 5. So pause the video for a few minutes, and then have a look at my solution and see how you did. Okay, so um, first, hopefully you drew a diagram. So here's the before picture. Here's the after picture. Let's call the final speeds V1 final at the 10 kilogram mass and V2 final for the 5 kilogram mass. So we have action reaction force. The force F was on the 10 kilogram. Now that should be directed, say, towards the west. <clears throat> if we draw a graph of the function, we see that in the region of interest, the force is a negative number. So therefore, it is indeed directed leftwards or towards the west. And so minus F would be towards the east. So set up the integral. Here's the impulse momentum theorem for the 10 kilogram mass and its final speed. And then for the 5 kilogram, you could go the through the integral, or you could just argue that since the force will be opposite, so is the impulse. So instead of a negative 16.6 impulse, we get a positive 16.6 impulse. So we get the final speeds of the two masses. So notice that we used the law of action-reaction there. We did not use the law of momentum conservation. Once you had V1 final, you could have got this using conservation of momentum, and you get the same result. So why is momentum conserved? Well, <clears throat> if we consider, say, a one-dimensional collision between these two objects, and um, if we were to call the force on the first object minus F, and the force on the second object plus F, because they all are an action-reaction pair, then, when we apply the uh, impulse momentum theorem to the first mass, then this will be the integral of minus f dt. And the force is the same magnitude, so when we apply it, the impulse momentum theorem to the second mass, m2, it's the integral of f dt. 
So these impulses are equal and opposite. So if we were to take the result of the first application of the theorem and add the second equation we get here, and these are all vector equations, of course, then on the left side, adding the left sides together, the two impulses are going to cancel out because they're equal and opposite. So what survives on the left side is m1 v1 plus m2 v2 initial. And I suppose, okay, just for you know real clarity, we can say we've got the two impulses here, which are clearly going to cancel out, right? They'll just wipe each other out because they're equal and opposite. So that's adding the left sides. Adding the right sides, well, it's m1 v1 plus m2 v2 final. So this then is the familiar law of conservation of momentum. It says the total initial momentum equals the total final momentum. And there's lots of ways to write that. We'll probably tend to use this one, the slightly more sophisticated form um, that relies on summation notation. But they're all good. All right, so let's quickly do a problem here. So here, um, problems drawn for you. We've got a thousand kilogram a car moving at 8 meters per second, striking a stationary motorcycle. Then after the collision, this is moving at V, this is moving at 5. So <clears throat> during the collision, the forces are equal and opposite. So if the force on this one is F, it doesn't really matter. You call it F or minus F. One of them's F, the other will be the opposite, minus F. When you add those together, again, the impulses will cancel out on this side and you'll arrive at the familiar physics 11 conservation of momentum equation. So let's just quickly apply that one. Initially the thousand is moving at 8, there's no momentum for the 800 kilogram. Afterwards we have a thousand V plus 800 moving at 5. So this is 8,000, this is 4,000 dividing by 1,000. We get a speed of 4 meters per second after the crash now is a vector, because this really is a vector equation. It's in the positive i direction. Now we're also asked to find the kinetic energy loss, so we'll apply the work energy theorem in the non-conservative work format. And at the beginning we just have kinetic energy of the car, there is non-conservative work because this collision generates a lot of heat energy. At the end, the car is going at 4 meters per second and the motorcycle is going at 5 meters per second. So we have two kinetic energies at the end and we find the amount of heat energy created, which is the loss of kinetic energy. And so there's mechanical energy loss, that's why it's negative. That mechanical energy gets converted to heat and also to you know doing bending work and things like that on the fender, but we'll assume for simplicity that it all goes to heat, it's 14 kilojoules. All right, so that was a one-dimensional problem. Uh, the law of conservation of momentum also applies fairly nice and easily to um, two dimensions. So these two masses are going to collide with each other. There's a two kilogram and a five kilogram, that's what those numbers mean. And then um, when they collide, the two forces will be equal and opposite, so they're F and minus F again. Um, I, don't know, I guess let's let's just doesn't really matter. Let's call this one F. The force on the five is F. The force on the two is minus F. So if we call this one M one and this one M two, then this experiences the force minus F. This one experiences the force F. When we add it together. The impulses cancel out and we get the sum of the initial momenta on this side equals the sum of the final momentum on this side. So for the initial momentum, we'll use i and j notation. We've got the 2 kilogram with an x speed of 3 cos 50i and a y speed of 3 sin 50j. Then the 5 kilogram is going at negative 1 j meters per second. <coughs> so that's the total initial momentum. That'll equal the total final momentum. After the collision, the 2 kilogram is going at minus 
j, and the 5 kilogram has an unknown speed of v final. So this equation now can be solved for that final speed. Solving for the final speed of the 5 kilogram mass, we'll get 0.77i plus 0.52j meters per second. So that's a two-dimensional collision. Again, solved very efficiently using I and J notation. <clears throat> now, we had a collision um, a few pages ago that um, where a significant amount of kinetic energy was transformed into thermal energy. You may know that that's called an inelastic collision. And there's a parameter known as the coefficient of restitution that tells us how elastic is our collision. The coefficient of restitution is simply the ratio of relative speeds after the collision, so that's the relative speed of the two objects after, and then we divide by the relative speed before the collision. So this is our coefficient of restitution. Now notice that if the collision is completely inelastic, and that means the objects stick together, then they have the same final velocity, that means there's zero here in the numerator. That means the coefficient of restitution is zero for a completely inelastic collision. Now, um, we can show that if a collision is completely elastic, then this coefficient of restitution is one. We can show it, but it's a lot of hard algebra, so we'll just take it as given for now. So we see the restitution coefficient varies from zero to one, depending on how elastic the collision is. So this makes it a really useful number. <clears throat> so, how do we use this number? Well, um, we're going to um, do this example together. So here we've got a 6 kilogram object going at 5 meters per second, and it hits a 2 kilogram going in the opposite direction at 2 meters per second. And then we want to find the final speed of the two masses. So that means they're both unknown and we're told the coefficient of restitution. So, um, in these questions we always assume that these collisions happen in a closed system. That means friction is small and the collision time is very short. So, initial momentum equals final momentum. So, as a vector, notice that because the 2 kilogram is moving to the left, it's got negative i momentum. So there's our momentum equation. So there's two unknowns on this side, and so uh, we can't solve this equation directly. So we have 30 minus 4, 26 units of momentum, 6 v1 final plus 2 v2 final, and then we have to stop there. So we need uh, more information in order to solve this. This comes to us from the coefficient of restitution. So we write out the definition, relative speed after the collision, relative speed before the collision, and we were told in this case it was 1. So these two are unknowns, the final speeds after the collision. Um, the initial speeds were given, so this is 5 and this was 2 to the left, so it's 5 subtract minus 2. So that's 7, which we cross multiply, and then we bring the v1 final over to the other side. So we find that v2 final is 7 greater than v1 final. So this result for v2 final can now be substituted back in here into this equation and then can be solved. We have a system, right, of two equations and two unknowns. So you can solve this in a number of ways, but I'm going to do it by substitution. So for v2 final in the momentum equation, I'm going to substitute in this result here. So I now have 2v1 final, 6v1 final, 8v1 final on this side, and then this is 26 minus 14, it's 12. So v1 final is 12 over 8, 1 and a half meters per second. And then substituting that in here, we find that v2 final is 8 and a half meters per second. Now just as a note, 
remember on the previous page we said if the coefficient of restitution was 1 that corresponded to an elastic collision. You can check that by finding the kinetic energies before the collision and the kinetic energies after the collision. And when you do that, um, you will find, well, I guess I'll show you the work. So it's a half of 6 times 5 squared plus a half of 2 times 2 squared. That's before. After the collision, we have a half of 6. Oh, you, that's a half. My goodness. This is why I wasn't going to show you. Ah, come on, eraser. It's a half of 6 times 1.5 squared. My goodness. Plus a half of 2 times 8 and a half squared. That was V2 final and V1 final. We've substituted in here on the side. So you find 0 when you work that out, and that means there's no mechanical energy lost, and that's our definition of an elastic collision, which at least justifies somewhat or gives you an example showing that what I said earlier is not wrong. Um, an elastic collision has a restitution of 1. So let's just conclude at this point. Um, <clears throat> the, the coefficient of restitution varies from 0 to 1, and it just tells us how elastic the collision is, with 0 being stick together completely inelastic and 1 being totally elastic, and the number varying between 0 and 1. So we're almost at the end here. Um, it's now time for you to try a problem just to practice what we just did. So it's a collision in one dimension with the coefficient of restitution. So start with the impulse momentum theorem and then find the final speeds of the two objects. Pause the video for a minute and give this a try. Okay, so starting with the impulse momentum theory, remember the forces will be F and minus F. So if you add together, then the impulses cancel and you end up with the total initial momentum on this side and the total final momentum on this side. So visualize, apply momentum. It's helpful to take the equation and divide by a thousand. That makes the math easier. Apply restitution, get another equation, plug it back in, and solve. There's your answers. If you got that, then you're in good shape for class. We'll pick it up at this point and do a problem together.